changes us, it changes what we see, what we see.
Ezekiel 28, Isaiah chapter 14. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Tonight, Lord, we, um, we get a lot of questions answered in Ezekiel chapter 28. We, we have a subject here tonight, Lord, that a lot of people ask questions about. They don't understand certain things. And this chapter, coupled with Isaiah 14, Lord, is going to give us answers to some really tough questions. And so, Lord, there is a lot of application from the text that we're going to study tonight, Lord, probably more than we'd ever be able to talk about tonight. And so, since we're going to be taking a peek into the spiritual realm, we pray, Lord, that each of us who are living in the physical realm would just receive from you, Lord, uh, protection. We would come to understand that there is a world that surrounds ours that is unseen. And even when we walk in this building to focus on worshiping you, studying your word, building each other up in our most holy faith, Lord, the dark side of the unseen realm is always at work trying to distract and keep us from both hearing and applying your word. So tonight, Lord, I pray that you would just give us the utmost of wisdom. We would see things tonight that take our walk with you to a new level of maturity, that we would learn, Lord, how to stand against the dark realm as we live in this world, Lord. So speak clearly tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to take communion at the end of the service tonight. So our midweek series in the book of Ezekiel is titled The Glory of God, and we're currently in the third major section of the book of Ezekiel, and I want you to remember two things tonight just as a a simple review, and the first is that the southern kingdom of Israel has recently been sieged by the mighty Babylonians. We saw that just a few chapters back. And in just a short time from what we're reading tonight, Nebuchadnezzar will conquer the southern kingdom of Judah, will destroy Jerusalem, will destroy the temple. The Jewish people will be scattered, many of them 
killed, others carried off captive to Babylon in that third and final wave. That's the first thing I want you to remember. And then the second thing is that chapters 25 through 32, in these chapters, God is pronouncing judgment on seven Gentile nations that surround Judah. And we've got a map of that up on the screen. Um, in fact, yeah, could you thank you? Just we've got these seven nations that God is going to judge. And I want you to understand that God's judgment of these nations isn't random or capricious. God didn't just wake up one morning and say, you know what? I'm in a bad mood today. I'm just going to wipe out some people. That is not the character of our God. The judgment of these seven nations is based on each nation's violation of a universal principle found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. We call this the Abrahamic covenant. And I'll read it. God speaks, and he's speaking to Abraham. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so as you study this out, you realize that God is ultimately going to send the Savior of the world. The Jews called him Messiah. The Greeks called him the Christ. We know him as Jesus of Nazareth, and he was going to come into the world through the nation of Israel. And so God says to the rest of the nations of the world, those of you who bless my people Israel, I'm going to bless you. And those of you who curse my nation Israel, you are going to be cursed. And so two weeks ago, we looked at the prophecies concerning the judgment of the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Edomites and the Philistines. And each of these nations were judged because they either contributed to or gloated over the judgment of God's people when he judged Judah by bringing the Babylonians against them. And then last week, we began studying the prophecies concerning the judgment of Tyre and Sidon, two of the most wealthy cities in the ancient world. And they were located a, along the... Uh, Mediterranean sea coast in what is now modern day Lebanon. And so tonight will be part two of the prophecies against Tyre and Sidon. And I've got a very unique message title tonight. My message is titled, Where Did the Devil Come From? And if you know your Bible well, you know that Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 are the clearest expositions of, of the fall of, of Lucifer. And so we'll see that tonight. So beginning at Ezekiel 28, verse 1, we're going to set the scene by taking a real close look at these two verses. And so we're going to have all the scripture on the screen tonight. It begins, it says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God. We're going to pause there for a minute. We're going to be doing a lot of pausing at odd places in the scriptures tonight. In chapters 26 and 27, Ezekiel had prophesied against the whole city of Tyre. But I want you to notice now his message is directed specifically towards a person who is called the Prince of Tyre. Now, in the NIV... The word is ruler. And so if you've got an NIV, it says here the ruler of Tyre. And the wording here should really get our attention because normally when God is addressing the leader of a nation throughout the scriptures, he is labeled as the king of that nation. We've seen that countless times as we've studied the Old Testament together. The Hebrew word that's used here is nagid. And I've got it up on the screen. I didn't give you the Hebrew characters. But it often describes a ruler or what we would call the man at the top. And so what's being described here is the man who is in charge of the city of Tyre. But, but the wording here should really get our attention. God rarely uses this phrase, prince, instead of a king. And so... 
God is now telling Ezekiel, hey, I want you to give a special word to the man who is in charge of the city of Tyre. And it's pretty easy to just go do your homework and you can find that this man was called Ithbaal the third, and he ruled from 591 BC to 572 BC, and he was a wicked man. Now I have a question here. And the question is, is why didn't God simply refer to this Ithbaal the third as the king of Tyre? We oftentimes look at a text of scripture and the, the best way to understand that text of scripture is to start ans- asking questions. And the answer that we're going to find is that as we go through this chapter, we're going to find that God addresses the prince of Tyre, and then later God addresses someone called the king of Tyre. And we're going to find that the prince of Tyre was the human ruler, but the king of Tyre was the spiritual entity behind the human ruler that we know as Ithbaal the third. And so let's begin here in verses 2 through 10, and we're going to look at the judgment of the human ruler of Tyre. And as I read this, I want you to really pay attention to how this reflects so many people in our society today that are wealthy, um, that are successful, maybe businessmen, celebrities, stuff like this. Ezekiel 28.2, God says, Son of man, that's a title he gives to Ezekiel throughout the book. He says, Say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God. And so the underlying sin of this man named Ithbaal the third was his pride and and his arrogance. And it prompted him to view himself as a God. And I I mean, that, that should just make you feel kind of uncomfortable, right? Just for some guy to be so full of himself that he saw himself as a god. But what you'll remember is that in Ezekiel's day, much like the Romans during the time of Christ or the time of the apostles, these Caesars in Rome viewed themselves as divine. The ruler of Tyre was much the same. He believed, I am actually a god. And so verses 3 through 5, God reveals the reasons that the king had this prideful heart and that he viewed himself as a god. Beginning at verse 3, he says, Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. Now, I did some study. There's a good reason to believe that what God actually said through Ezekiel is, so you think you're wiser than Daniel. So, so the Hebrew is probably, maybe, I shouldn't say it that way, the English here in the New King James is probably not the best translation of the Hebrew. This should be a, a question. God says to the prince of Tyre, this Ithbaal third. So, so you think you're, you're as wise or wiser than Daniel, do you? All right. And he goes on and he says, there's no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. We'll we'll pause there for a minute. So this Ithbaal III, the man who was in charge of the city of Tyre, he had attained great wisdom and he was an extremely cunning Man And by his wisdom, he'd made himself and the people of Tyre, as we saw last week, they were just filthy rich. And his success had him convinced that he was a god and and not a man. And so the question I asked you to just kind of ponder as we were looking at the 
the beginning of, of this section here is think about how a lot of really successful, rich, wealthy people view themselves. You know, and a lot of them do kind of conduct themselves as if they thought they were a god. They, they believe they've attained godlike status. And you might say, really? I've never heard of anybody like acting that way. Now, I will rarely do something like I'm going to do tonight, but I, I'm going to show you a very controversial figure who believes through his words that he has attained godlike status. 2013, Kanye West released a song titled, I Am a God. And in it, he raps these words, okay? He, and I'm not going to try to rap it, okay? Can I get some background music, please? I have no idea. He says, here, here, he's rapping these words. He said, I just talked to Jesus. He said, what up, Jesus? I said, blank, I'm chilling trying to stack these millions. I know he the most high, but I am a close high. I am a God. I am a God. I am a God. That just sends chills down my spine for a person to be so successful and to think so highly of themselves that even if he doesn't believe this, that he would rap this, that he would sing these words, and it's, you know, he's bold enough at least to sing what a lot of people believe about themselves. I am a God, you know. The New Age movement really promotes this idea that, that we can all attain godlike status. The entire Mormon religion is built upon this idea that we are all moving towards a higher level of godhood. And so it's not quite as out there as it might sound to us. What we're seeing is that the Prince of Tyre wasn't the last man corrupted by wealth and success. And we'll talk about that more towards the end as we get into some applications. But God now, in verse 6, he confronts the human Prince of Tyre. It's, it's as if he's saying, oh, so you're a God, are you? Right, let's talk about that. So verse 6, he says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? But you shall be a man and not a God. In the hand of him who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. You know, what I find so interesting here is that this prince of Tyre bragged about having the, the wisdom of Daniel. I, I'm wiser than Daniel, and yet he ignored the basic principles that were taught in the, the foremost handbook on wisdom that you and I call the Old Testament book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs 16, 18, Solomon writes, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so we're about to see that the prince of Tyre, his pride is going to lead to destruction. His haughty spirit is going to lead to his downfall. And, and what God just promised in these previous verses that he's, he's not only going to send strangers to conquer and to destroy this king, and to destroy his city, to destroy everything he had built and amassed, but he was going to prove to the prince of Tyre that he was not a god. And the reason why is because a god cannot be killed by a human being. And God was about to send a man named Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonians at this time, to come and kill him. And so notice also it says in the end of the text there, verse 10, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. 
what that really means is it's the, the death of, of an ungodly person. It's, it's a humiliating death, a, uh, a graceless death. And so Ezekiel's prophecies came to pass in 573 when Ithbaal III was removed from his throne by Nebuchadnezzar and he died a disgraceful death at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. History proves that this prophecy came to pass very quickly. So now in verse 11, things change a little bit and God's judgment is now shifting from the human ruler of Tyre and now we're going to see the judgment of the spiritual ruler of Tyre. And this is going to cover verses 11 through 19. And what God's about to do is he's going to give us a glimpse behind the veil that separates the physical world that you and I live in and the spiritual world that surrounds us, that influences us, and that most people really don't want to talk about you know, they, they, they don't want to know that there is a spiritual world surrounding ours and that in that spiritual world are dark, malevolent creatures that have been dispatched to kill, steal, and destroy, according to Jesus. So we'll talk more about that. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 11. The Lord continues. He says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, thus says the Lord. Re remember, a lamentation is a funeral song, and we've seen lamentations now three times within our study of the book of Ezekiel. One of them was last week. Now I'm wondering, did you notice a change from the first section to this section? In the first section, the Lord addressed the prince of Tyre. That was Ithbaal III, but now he's addressing the king of Tyre. And what we're about to find is that God is addressing the spiritual entity that is above or an authority figure over, maybe we could say in control of, Ithbaal III, who we call the prince of Tyre. So before we go on, let, let me just make a point that we see here back in verse 10. Back in verse 10, God confronted Ithbaal, and he says, I, I'm confronting you because you're claiming to be a divine creature, even though you are just a mere man. And God says, I'm going to prove that you're a mere man when Nebuchadnezzar ends your life. Everybody's going to know you're a mere man. But here in verses 11 through 19, Ezekiel described this person called the king of Tyre, and as we go through these verses, you're going to see terms that could not apply to a mere man. God is not addressing a man. God is now addressing a spiritual entity. So let's read that description. Right in the middle of verse 12 into verse 13, God now speaking to this king of Tyre, he says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So there's our first clue, folks. There is no way that Ithbaal III, the one we've been talking about up to this time, was old enough to have been alive in the garden of Eden. If you go back and you read Genesis chapters 1 through 4, and you could get away with chapters 1 through 3, but, but in chapters 1 through 3, really, you find that there were four people in the Garden of Eden. There was the Lord God, there was Adam, there was Eve, and there was the serpent that deceived Eve and deceived Adam. And so we realize right here that we're dealing with that serpent who we know as Satan or the devil. For the most part, as we go through this text, we're going to call him Lucifer because the, the parallel text to this that we're going to look at in a minute is Isaiah chapter 14. And he's given what's not really a name. Uh, it's, it's more like a description. He was the, the, the morning light, the light of the morning. And so what God is doing here is he is revealing that there was a spiritual entity, a spiritual power 
behind the pride and the arrogance in Ithbaal the third, and that person was Satan himself. And so here in Ezekiel chapter 28, God recounts the, the creation, the previous position, and the fall of Lucifer. And so I want you to pay attention to all of the past tense verbs as I read Ezekiel 28 verses 12 through 14. All right. God is speaking now to to Lucifer. He says, you were, past tense, the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So we see here that Lucifer was a perfectly created and beautifully, beautifully glorious being. Keep reading. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, the topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. And so if you start comparing scripture with scripture, where else do you find many of these same precious stones? It was on the breastplate of the high priest in Israel. So as we compare scripture to scripture, we we realize that the precious stones speak of the fact that Lucifer once had a priestly role in heaven. The timbrels and the pipes, these, these are instruments, musical instruments. So they indicate that before his fall, he, he ministered before the Lord in music. Some people will go as far as saying that Satan was the worship leader in heaven before he fell. The scripture doesn't actually say that, but there's an implication here that part of his ministry included the equivalent of heavenly musical instruments. And then verse 14, he says, you were the anointed cherub who covers I established you. You put some time into this and you dig into this verse, you realize that verse 14 is revealing that God established Lucifer among or possibly even as the highest ranking of the angels. It's possible that he was the highest ranking angel. If not, he was among those that we call the archangels, Michael and Gabriel. And so he was obviously in this incredibly high position. God goes on, he says, you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. If you compare this to Zechariah chapter 2, the fiery stones seem to indicate that he dwelt in, in, in what we would maybe call the inner circle of God's presence. He dwelt in God's very throne room is what it looks like. And then I want you to notice the change in verse 15. We still have these past tense verbs here. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And so for some unknown period of time, Lucifer existed in this state of perfection the way the other angels did. And then God says, there came that fateful day where you exercised your free will. God is saying, just as the human prince of Tyre exercised his free will and rebelled and it cost him his life, it cost him his kingdom, God says of Satan that he also was created with a free will And at some point, he abandoned who God created him to be. And he he abandoned humility. He became prideful. And he began to think himself greater than he was. Remember the king of Tyre? The prince of Tyre, I'm sorry. You're a mere man, but you're thinking you're a god. And now God is speaking to the spiritual creature and he's saying listen you you were of the highest order but it was not enough for you you wanted more and that led to your downfall and so Isaiah now if you will turn in your Bible to Isaiah 14 we'll pick it up around verse 12 just to save time but Isaiah he he begins to record what was going on in the heart of Lucifer 
that led him from this perfect created being to his fall where he became Satan. Chapter 14, verse 12 of Isaiah, the scripture says, and this is again God speaking, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. And so what we're about to see here is often referred to as the five I wills of Satan. And God begins to talk about what was going on in Lucifer's heart that led to his fall. Look at verse 13. For you have said in your heart, and I'll just pause if you don't mind, pride, arrogance, rebellion, this is called a heart issue. Sometimes people will say, so God created the devil? No, God created this glorious perfect being and this being had a heart issue and his heart issue was discontentment pride arrogance selfish ambition look at what he does here as his this prideful heart issue begins to manifest he says here i will ascend into heaven Oh, it's not enough that you are the highest order of being, maybe even the highest of the highest order. That's not enough for you. Now you want to ascend <clears throat> to the place of God. He says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars of God here are probably referring to the other angels. So he's saying, listen, I am going to become the greatest of all God's creations. Then he says, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. We see their selfish ambition. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. There's a heart issue here. This creature is filled with pride. And so we'll flip now back to Ezekiel 28. We don't have time to go really into all the depths there and the details. I just wanted you to see that Isaiah records what was going on in Lucifer's heart. But as we get back to Ezekiel, Ezekiel tells us how those heart issues manifested in Lucifer's life. And we're now going to call him Satan because he has now fallen. And now he is the deceiver. He's the accuser. He's the malevolent one. And so Isaiah, having recorded the heart issues that led to Lucifer's fall, Ezekiel now comes along and he says, look at how a prideful, arrogant, selfish, ambition heart conducts itself. Verse 16 of Ezekiel 28, by the abundance of your trading... You became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane, a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Now, I want to just tell you, I've actually been studying the Bible for over 35 years now, and I've studied this passage so many times, I, I can't even count it. And I will tell you that every time in my younger years I would read this, I would just go, what? Scholars have wrestled with this text since it was written. 
And you should read the commentaries. You read one commentary, and you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. And then you read another commentary, and it's just like, well, that makes even less sense. And what you find is that this is one of those portions of Scripture where what people are trying to do is take every little detail and try to make it fit into what we've already seen in the relationship between Satan and the Lord. And in 35 years of studying, I've, I've come to understand something. And please, don't, don't hear me saying that I have figured something else out that all the other scholars haven't. I've just come to an understanding of this text that I think is pretty simple. And that is that God is describing things that took place before, during, and after Ezekiel's time. He's describing things that go on in our time and that are going to go on in our future. And so we can't read this and try to label each sentence with something in history or some other part of the Bible. What God is trying to say here is that I'm giving you the past, the present, and the future of my relationship with Lucifer slash Satan. But what's neat about this is that each of the things that God is speaking about here, God speaks of them in the past tense as if they've already taken place because in God's mind, his judgments are so sure that they are going to come to pass. So things that we read here as if it already took place, it, it may take place in the future, but in God's mind, he's saying it's a done deal. And I'll just go over a couple of things that are in this text. I'm not going to pull out all the details because there's a lot here. But, but I'm just going to share a few things, and, and Isaiah 14 will shed some light on this. But go back to verse 16. God says, By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. What Ezekiel is describing here is what we would call Lucifer or Satan's competitive spirit. That as he's looking at himself compared to the other created angelic beings, the other cherubim. He decided, I've got to be the top dog. I've got to find a way to exalt myself above every other angel until I can make myself equal with my creator, God. And he even speaks in there in verse 16 about violence. And so Satan resorts to violence to get his way. And you would say, well, well, what are some examples of that? In Revelation chapter 12, we read about this violent cosmic battle between Satan and all of the fallen angels that followed him. And they're battling with Michael the archangel and the armies of God. And there's this war in heaven. And then Satan's violence is also turned towards mankind. Just think about all of the violent things we've read about in the Bible where Satan is trying to stop the will of God. Murdering the children at the time of Moses. Murdering all of the boys two years and under at the time of the birth of Christ. What about John 10.10 10, where Jesus says that Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Who's he trying to steal from? You and I. Who does he want to kill? You and I. Who does he want to destroy? You and I. Why does he hate us so much? Can you imagine being with the Father and being with Jesus before mankind is created and you're just thinking, man, I am the apple of God's eye. And then human beings come along. And you're like, those guys are nothing special, not compared to us. And you begin to see God's plan for the ages playing out. And you realize God loves those sinful, fallen human beings so much that he would send his son Jesus to die for them. And Satan looks at us and he goes, I hate you. I hate how God loves you. And I want to do everything I can to destroy what God loves because now I hate God. And so you, you realize this enemy of ours 
he is not just sitting around like waking up every day going, I wonder what I'm going to do today. He wakes up every day. I doubt he sleeps, but he wakes up every day with a plan to destroy our lives. As you study the scriptures, it seems very clear from various portions of scripture that there are territorial demonic spirits. Remember in the book of Daniel, we had a guy called the Prince of Persia. He was a high-ranking authority in a major world city. And Jesus talks about the fact that little children have angels. So on the other side of the equation, you got to think and believe that, that each one of us has a or a few demonic spirits assigned to us. And every day they're just doing what they can to trip us up so that he can kill, steal, and destroy. Keep going in verse 16. He says, therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Verse 18, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. So God's response was to first cast Lucifer out of his presence in heaven down to the earth where he appeared in the Garden of Eden as a serpent. So we now find him living on the earth. The book of Job records that Satan still has access to God's throne. Revelation 12 records that when he approaches God's throne, he does so to accuse you and I day and night. That's what he does. He accuses us. In that long text we just read, and then I'll add verse 19, the Lord said, I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. And then verse 19, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You've become a horror and shall be no more forever. And so during the tribulation, we read that Jesus is going to cast Satan into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, he's going to be released to roam the earth to deceive those whose hearts were really not turned to the Lord. He's going to have one more chance at the earth. Then Jesus is going to take him and the false prophet and Antichrist. They're going to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And he's going to be done. And that's what we've been reading about here. But we notice here that it says that you're going to be a horror to those who see you. The horror is going to be this reminder to those who have gone through the millennium. And then they see Satan released and they realize the world has followed this guy. And now God has thrown him into a pit. And they begin to realize that that's going to be their fate also because they rejected Christ. And uh, this is, again, at the end of the millennium. Those who followed Satan that last time, they realize that's going to be our fate. Because we played games with Jesus, we followed the devil, and we lived as citizens of his kingdom undercover. So just as God had destroyed Ishbaal III and his city called Tyre, God promises this future judgment and destruction of Satan and the kingdom of darkness that he rules over. Then in verse 20, it changes again, and, and Ezekiel now prophesies the judgment against Sidon. And we'll pick it up in verse 20 through 23 in a second. But remember that Sidon was a sister city of Tyre. She was located uh, about 15 or 20 miles further up the Mediterranean coast from Tyre. She was a merchant city, a port city, and this is what one commentator wrote after studying historically this area. He said, like Tyre, Sidon was as full of sin as it was with riches. 
And so again, she's a very wicked city, just like Tyre. Pick it up in verse 20. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face towards Sidon and prophesy against her and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Sidon. I will be glorified in your midst, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I execute judgments in her and am hallowed in her. For I will send pestilence upon her and blood in her streets. The wounded shall be judged in her midst by the sword against her on every side. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. I wonder if you noticed something, if you've been here for the last three studies. When we studied Ammon and Moab and we studied Edom and we studied Philistia and we studied Tyre, every one of those cities When God confronted them, he made a very detailed list of the sins that they had committed against his people Israel and why he was judging them. And as we read through here, did you notice that God did not list anything about the sins of Sidon? And it makes you wonder, like, why is he judging her? Most scholars agree that Sidon was so closely associated with Tyre that she shared the same sins and now would uh, share the same judgment as Tyre. But there is one verse in here, verse 24, where God summarizes the impact that Sidon had on his chosen people Israel. And it's found here in verse 24. He says, There shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all all who are around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And so what we do read is that the people of Sidon, in the same way as the other cities that God has already judged, they had an effect on God's people. They were like pricking briars. They were like painful thorns. And they despised God's people. Sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, it's not enough just to see what's there. I, I don't know if you're this way, but I'm like, what does it mean that they were a pricking briar? You ever stuck your hand in like a rose bush and you pull it out and your whole wrist is just torn up? You know, that, that's kind of the idea I get here. But what I did is I went back and I started reading. And, and obviously, you know, we, we know there's a lot of connection between Israel and Sidon. But if you go back to 1 Kings 16, you got this king named Ahab. And he was ruling over Israel, and he married Jezebel. Do you know whose Jezebel dad was? Jezebel's dad was the human king of the city of Sidon at that time. And so Ahab marries a Sidonian woman. And because of her influence, Ahab builds a temple to Baal in Samaria. He built an altar. He erected a wooden image of Baal. And by doing this, he introduced Baal worship as an official religion in Israel. And you begin looking at it, and it's just like, so what is this pricking briar and the painful thorn to God's people? It was the idolatrous worship of Baal. You start thinking, you know, idolatry is not that big of a deal. No, it's like sticking your arm into a thorn bush and, and ripping it out. That's all it is. That's what false religion does to a child of God. And so God says, hey, I'm, I'm going to judge Sidon by doing a couple of things. He said he's going to send pestilence, and he's going to send the sword of Babylon to fill their streets with blood. And so the judgment of Sidon would accomplish two things. Look at verse 22. God says, this is is what the Sidonians are going to experience. Verse 22 says that God's going to be glorified in their midst. He is going to show the Sidonians that he is stronger than the God they worship, Baal. It's as if they're saying, hey, our God and your God are going to war. And God says, yeah, and I'm going to win. And he shows himself stronger than Baal. And again in verse 22, the people of Sidon would know that although Babylon physically destroyed them and filled their streets with blood, 
They would know because of the prophecies of Ezekiel that it was actually God behind all of that. One more quote. We're going to draw this to a close. Look up at the screen. An American um, theologian named Daniel Block wrote these words. He said, the fulfillment of this prophetic word is confirmed by Nebuchadnezzar's court register, which mentions the king of Sidon along with other notables from conquered states. So archaeologists found this register, notes from Nebuchadnezzar's annals, and it basically talks about the fact that he conquered the king of Sidon. And so, just as we've seen with every one of these other cities, God prophesied it through Ezekiel, and then history proved it to have taken place. And so, Sidon completely wiped away. Next week, as we get into chapter 29, we'll study the prophecies of the destruction of Egypt. Theirs is a little bit different than these other six But we're going to end tonight. Uh, Chapter 28 closes with another prophecy. And it's a prophecy on how the destruction of these first six nations or cities would impact the glorious future of the Jewish people. We're going to be looking at verses 24 through 26, but I want to recap here. A quick history lesson. God's judgment began when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. That's what we just finished studying in the book of Hosea. By the way, wasn't Hosea great? We're going to the book of John next. The Gospel of John on Sundays, beginning not this Sunday, but next. And then that was phase one. And then phase two of God's judgment began when Babylon sieged Judah on January 15th, 588 B.C. And then phase three was when... Nebuchadnezzar completed his destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., completely destroyed the city and the temple, carried off that third wave of captives. And then the next thing that God did is he pronounced judgment on Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, and Sidon. And over the last three studies, we have seen that these people were utterly wiped off the face of the earth. Have you met an Ammonite lately? They don't exist anymore. And even though there's a city called Tyre, it's not the same city that we read about here. It's in a different location. And prophecy is that it would never be rebuilt, and it hasn't. What's different about the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah is that God promised that they would be restored. These other six nations would be completely wiped off the face of the earth. But after God judged his people, he would bring them back to the land that he drove them out of. And I'll read you that account in verses 24 through 26. But first I have to tell you that this is one of those portions of scripture that has both a near and a far fulfillment. We call it the law of double reference in theology where the same prophecy or the same prediction has a close fulfillment and a far fulfillment so look at verse 24 there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all who are around them who despise them thus says the Lord God when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and am hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. That's the land of Israel. And they will dwell safely there. They will build houses, plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely when I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God. So the near fulfillment began in 538 B.C. when the Persian king Cyrus made a decree that allowed the Jewish captives to return home and rebuild their temple. You remember Zerubbabel took the first wave of captives back, and then later Ezra went. And and then later, in 444 B.C., Artaxerxes made what turns out to be the fourth decree 
concerning the Jews. And this fourth decree commissioned Nehemiah to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem's city walls. And that enabled them to finally dwell safely from the people that despised them. And so that was the near fulfillment of these three verses that we just read. But if you've been here as I've taught through the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, some of the minor prophets, you realize like this wasn't quite as glorious a return to the land as Ezekiel prophesied. It's kind of not quite what we expected. And the reason why is because that was the near fulfillment and it wasn't going to be completed. The far fulfillment has yet to occur, but it will at the ultimate restoration of Israel during the millennial reign of Christ upon the earth. When you see all of those Old Testament promises made to Israel that to this point are unfulfilled or only partially fulfilled during the millennium, they are going to be completely fulfilled. And then we will see the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecies we just read in verses 24 through 26. So listen, that's our study for tonight. I'm going to give you two takeaways. As I give you these takeaways, the worship team's going to come up and prepare to lead us in communion. But listen carefully. Here's our two takeaways. And the first is that you and I, we have to guard ourselves against the kind of pride that, lead, that led to the downfall of Ishbaal the third and to the downfall of Lucifer. You know, we read this biblical story and we're like, wow, man, that Ishbaal the three, that, that dude fell hard and Satan, wow, he really fell hard. We read the Bible for personal application and what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us tonight is that we've got to guard ourselves during times when God is blessing the work of your hands. And you've got to guard yourself when God appoints you to some position of authority. You've got to remain humble. But, and, and this is, I added this later. I don't know who this is for, but guard yourself if God has blessed you with physical beauty or wealth. Sometimes we think, yeah, this makes me special. I am a God. I doubt anybody thinks you're a God, but it's easy to have this heart pride, this pride attitude. And second takeaway for tonight is we need to recognize that there is a spiritual world that surrounds and influences the physical world we live in. Satan and his network of demonic spirits hold great influence over unsaved human beings. And oftentimes you and I have conflicts and we have to remember that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the principalities and the powers and the authorities that live behind the scenes, that live behind the veil. Here in chapter 28, Satan was pulling the strings of the human king of Tyre. And every once in a while, people will say, man, I'm just, I don't know what's going on in Washington. How can these people be doing such horribly wicked things? Aha! Chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14 remind us that there is a dark spiritual world that surrounds us. And I always just get this picture when I see something going on in some high power, high profile government leader. I always get the picture of like Satan as a puppet master and he's just going, pulling the strings. And so sometimes you may say, man, there's things going on in, in Washington and in politics and in world stuff, and it just seems so demonic. It is. It is. And chapter 28 showed us that. There was a king of Tyre that was pulling the strings of the prince of Tyre. It teaches us how to pray. But at the same time, you can rest assured, because just as God judged the human king of Tyre, and in the future, he's going to finalize his judgment of Satan. He will not allow modern men that violate his holy character to remain unpunished. He will deal with those who are in those positions. So I think what we want to do right now is we want to spend a few minutes as the worship team leads us in the song. We need to examine our hearts we need to look for patterns of sin 
pride, arrogance, we need to confess those to the Lord, especially in the realm of what we're talking about tonight. Maybe the Lord's going to be revealing tonight that, that some are just, we're starting to get prideful, we're starting to get arrogant, we're starting to just kind of act like we're not accountable to others. And the Lord, He wants to speak to that. And, and then I've got one more portion of scripture I want to read you before we take communion together. So let, let's sing this song. you at your table tonight. Pray, Lord, in these just closing minutes, you would speak to our hearts, that we would understand more of what Jesus provided for us at the cross. Amen. In our communion services, we always try to keep things pretty simple. When we take communion, we are Remembering the source of our salvation, in your, in your bottom cup, you have this piece of bread. It's an unleavened piece of bread, and it represents the sinless life of Jesus and that his physical body was broken to pay the price for our sins. And then in the cup, 
We have the juice, it represents the blood of Jesus Christ, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We, we have the price paid, and then in the cup, we're reminded that our guilt, our shame, our condemnation has been wiped away. And so tonight we're talking, you know, about the spiritual realm. We're, we're talking about spiritual warfare in a sense, and Colossians 2 speaks of, I think, an issue that's so important for believers. So let me read to you. It'll be up on the screen, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I, I want to pause there for a minute. Paul is addressing uh, a group of believers who have been impacted by some false teachers that are saying, hey, once you get saved, you still have to live by the law of Moses. And you've got to keep the law of Moses or you're not really saved. And Paul comes along and he says, listen, the Old Testament law was designed not to save us. It was designed, in a sense, to condemn us, to show us that there was no way we could possibly keep God's perfect standard. So when Jesus died on the cross, his perfection had already fulfilled the law of Moses. And when he died having fulfilled the law, and, and we are now in him by putting our faith in his finished work. Paul is telling us that Jesus' fulfilling of the law is now credited to you. So you're no longer bound by the law. So what does Satan do? He, he works through these highly religious people that come along and say, well, yeah, you've got to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then you've got to keep the law. You gotta be perfect. God's not gonna accept you unless you're perfect. And look at verse 15. Paul is now talking about when Jesus was on the cross. He says, having disarmed principalities and powers, those are New Testament terms for demonic spirits that assist Satan, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. And, and Paul says, listen, Satan is going to try every trick in the book to condemn you. Revelation 12, he appears before the Lord to accuse you day and night. And when his malevolent little spirits are interacting with you, they are trying to knock you down and condemn you. And Paul says, keep this in mind. Jesus disarmed them. He took the teeth out of their mouth. No matter what they say to you, he's the father of lies. Everything he speaks is a lie. He comes along and he goes, God doesn't love you. You know what you should hear? God loves you so much. Satan's lying to you. Paul says, when Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin, when his blood was shed to speak to the world and to say everybody who has put their faith in the finished work of Christ, shame, guilt, condemnation, is washed away. When Satan comes along and he starts condemning you, you remind yourself of Colossians chapter 2 that Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers. He took away their fight. They've got nothing to say to you. What can compete with the finished work of Jesus? Saint, you, in God's eyes, are perfect. And by the Holy Spirit, you are being perfected day by day. So I just figured tonight we needed to talk about that because so often Satan accuses us. And as we take communion tonight, we're proclaiming this is what I believe. His broken body paid for my sins. His shed blood has wiped away guilt, shame, and condemnation. 
but we also need to remember that he disarmed principalities and powers. When they come and they are condemning and attacking, we need to realize they are lying. They are trying to convince us that what Jesus did was not enough. And as we take communion tonight, I'm praying that these words from Colossians chapter 2 would just set believers free from the lies of the enemy that you have got to somehow add to the finished work of Jesus. You cannot. He has done everything that needs to be done. And that's what we celebrate tonight. Can we get an amen to that? Amen. Father, tonight we've had a wonderful time in your word, Lord. We're, we've learned about Satan. We, we've learned about the dark kingdom. And we finish our night remembering that Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. We are forever, Lord, indebted to what you did, but, but not in that indebted way that there's something we can do. We can't add at all to what Jesus has done. We just want to bring attention to it, and then we want to live each day, Lord, walking with you and glorifying with you by the choices that we make. This piece of bread, Lord, reminds us Jesus was perfect and he paid the price. This cup reminds us that we're not perfect, but that the price being paid, you have chosen to view us as if we are already glorified and perfected in your presence. You've wiped away the guilt. You've wiped away the condemnation. Lord, don't allow your blood-bought children to pick those things up again. Help us to stand against the wiles of the enemy, especially in this realm, Lord. So tonight we celebrate what you've done for us and the perspective that we can live with that the enemy, although he may lie to us, Lord, he cannot convince us that we need to be anything more than we are in Christ. We cannot in any way add to what Jesus did. So as we eat this bread, as we drink this cup, Lord, we thank you for the finished work of Jesus, and we pray we would now live our lives in a manner that glorifies you, but that causes others to come and to say, what's different about you? How can I know what you know? And we can tell them it's not what, it's who. Father, we just thank you. You're so good to us. Bless us tonight, Lord, as we go home and finish out this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Nothing on earth is as beautiful as you 
sing that again. You've opened my eyes to your wonders anew. You've captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. 